Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear me. Welcome to the new live stream only channel. This also has a subscriber only chat for now, which means you cannot add any chat messages unless you've been subscribed to this wonderful new channel for at least five minutes. Uh, so there's only 24 people watching, which is uh, fine. That's probably because this is a brand new channel and everything like that. But uh, tell your kids, tell your wife, tell your husband, your brother, etc., to uh, subscribe and add their chat messages here. If you can't hear me, then uh, this is going to be a very long and bizarre <laughs> live stream. Okay, so today in China time marks the day that Meng Wangzhou will return. And the two Michaels have also been released. And there's a couple of things that I wanted to bring up about this. Uh, so first of all, you're welcome, everybody, because clearly this was all my doing and nobody else did anything. Um, so I look forward to a, a high five from everybody as I see them walking around. <laughs> um Little update with me, I'm here in Shanghai. I'm a little bit more uh, revitalized after finding out that my uh, cancer was not cancer and my tumor was not cancer and my health is uh, as poor as it always was, as good as it likely will ever be, let's be honest, as I get older. Uh, so anyway, this deal that they reached was really quick. Anybody notice that? I mean, there was a little bit in the news about how it might be happening, and then boom, suddenly it was done. And there's a few reasons I think that this happened, but at the core of it really may very well be the fact that this case was very weak. And this is something that we didn't really know going into this situation in the beginning. Uh, there was evidence there certainly was a lot of evidence, but especially after the judge released her reasons for not allowing further evidence to be introduced, specifically the HSBC acquired evidence uh, from Hong Kong, after that document was released and I went through it, I realized that from a legal point of view, it's actually a very, very weak case. Um, and that's something that, hang on a second, somebody's messaging me. I hope it's not one of you guys telling me I have no no audio. <laughs> no, it's not. Okay, we're good. We're good. Sorry, everybody. <clears throat> um, reading that report really showed me that this was a, actually a very weak case, something that I was a bit surprised by. I thought that the situation would be that there was a strong case and that Previous companies that had been, you know, uh, accused of being violators of the Iran sanctions also had good cases against them. And that the main thing different about this situation was that they weren't fining the company, but rather arresting the executive for some reason. But it turns out actually that the case itself was very, very weak. And the judge even thought that as well. So I think if you combine that with the fact that, you know, Trump. Uh, made it very clear that this was a politically motivated and at least politically tied arrest, I think that that contributed to this. Um, now, obviously, it's not the only reason. You know, we still have the geopolitical angle. You have the Chinese government pressuring for her release. You have the American, you know, a lot of American people actually pressuring for this to go away. Canadians as well. You have the two Michael situation. You have all this stuff intertwined. But certainly it didn't help that at the end of the day, there really wasn't a case against Miss uh, Monk. So I think that that's something to, to really take away from this. And, uh, but, but why, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Political arrests with lack of evidence is nothing new. So why was this case actually let go? I think that the deal in part had to do with, thank you, Ryan, the audio is good. Uh, obviously, my voice is uh, immaculate, so there's no issue there. <laughs> um, I think that 
all the parties involved were kind of sick of this media circus around her and around Huawei uh, and this whole trade war. I, you know, the, the optimist in me wants to believe that somebody in the political left in America high up realized that, hey, we're just basically carrying on Trump's policies. Like, this is Trump's trade war. Why are we continuing to do this? That's, that's my optimistic view, or wish, I should say. But I think that all the countries involved realize that this isn't really helping anybody. It's not really a, a valid case. The evidence is very weak. And the evidence, to my untrained eye, in fact, shows that she didn't defraud HSBC. So it just kind of makes sense that it will fall apart. In a previous video, I said she would likely be extradited, and that was based on the fact that her evidence was being denied. So, I mean, I, I was definitely wrong about that. I mean, she was extradited to China. Uh, so that's good. I'm happy to be wrong because this issue is not about her, really, and it's not even really about Huawei to me. It's about countries getting along and countries living up to the standards that they themselves set. And this is something that is very hard for people to understand about me is that, you know, I, I, the other day I got called an anti-American by some weird uh, French military study or something. It was a bizarre uh, study that called me anti-American, which is totally insane, I mean, I sit here every day wishing I could go back to America and see a lot of my old friends that I really need to catch up with. I got stuff to do over there. America is a totally, totally important country. It needs to be respected. It needs to be allowed to thrive. I have a very strong personal connection with it, obviously. I, in short, really love America in many ways. But I also think that, at, especially internationally, there's a lot of room for improvement, to say the least. So anyway, I'm babbling. The point is, the thing that's important to me is that these countries hold up to their own standards, not to each other's standards. And if Canada says that it has rule of law, and if America says that, then they should uphold it. Or they should stop saying it, right? I mean, I think that this is a pretty basic um, point of view. And for some reason, it's very hard for people to understand me when I say this kind of stuff. It's not about America being bad. It's about America upholding American standards, not Chinese standards, American standards. So uh, I think that these countries have really um, done something constructive by working this out. Now, I haven't commented on the two Michaels before, and there's a reason for that, other than I just didn't have time to do a video about it. Uh, it's not because I, you know, as the as my critics will say, I'm just petrified. I'm just terrified to talk about it, everything, even though I just eventually talk about everything. Uh, but um, my cat's meowing out there. She really wants to be part of the stream, but I'm not going to do it, guys. Not this time. So the thing about the two Michaels that's interesting is, first of all, there's not any evidence beyond correlative timing that these cases are related to Meng Wanzhou. Now, that is evidence. It's not, for me personally, it's not enough evidence to say that it's definitively related. Um, so what I mean by that is they were arrested shortly after uh, Meng Wanzhou was, and they were released around the same time. On the face of that, if you don't think about it much, it seems like, well, they're definitely related, and this is just, you know, one caused the other. And that may be the case. I'm not saying that that's not the case at all. What I am saying is that when we look at the arrest of Meng Wanzhou and we look at the timing of it, the fact that it happened immediately after the start of the trade war, as I said in a previous video, that alone doesn't necessarily mean that that was the cause of her arrest. Okay? It's correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. So we know that they were related in that small sense, timing, 
they're temporally related, but is there more evidence to suggest that the trade war and Ms. Meng's uh, arrest were related? And the answer is yes, we have Donald Trump saying that. When we look at the two Michaels, it's slightly different because the majority of the reason that people suspect that they're related is just the timing, which for me is not enough to say definitively that they are related. So that's something to keep in mind because this story with them will continue to go on for a bit of time here as uh, as media tries to milk that um, in whatever way that they see fit. My point is, just because a lot of places say that they're linked doesn't necessarily mean that that's actually true. And so we have to you know, go by facts, something that's extremely, extremely unreasonable sounding to many people. But uh, it's totally possible that this was just as bad as everybody's, uh, you know, in the West seems to think that it's all this uh, uh, prisoner exchange and everything like that. That's totally possible. But we have to look at the actual evidence. And so far, the only evidence I'm aware of for that is the temporal correlation. In other words, that they aligned in time. There's also some more things about this that I wanted to talk about in another video, but I, I perhaps won't now because uh, this will this will wind down. But the other thing to realize is that even if we know for a fact, which we don't, but even if we know for a fact that they were arrested because Ms. Mung was arrested, that still doesn't mean that they didn't do the crimes that they're um, accused of. I mean, nobody ever mentions this. There is also the possibility that uh, the Chinese government knew that they were committing these crimes and didn't arrest them because they didn't want to make a, uh, a political, you know, uh, fiasco. And then after they saw that Canada and or the U.S. was willing to create this fiasco, then they said, fine, then we'll pull the trigger on people that we know are committing crimes. That's also a possibility. And that's a narrative and, and, and an option that you'll never see anywhere else. Like People just don't think about this in a realistic, charitable slash realistic way. That is also a possibility. That happens. The thing is, governments everywhere tend to be basically aware of the fact that there are people like spies and other you know, diplomats that are doing things that they don't like in their country. It's not like all these governments in the world are just idiots and they walk around thinking, well, no bad, you know, no foreign country would ever th do anything bad here. Of course they know that this is the case, right? The Chinese government, I'm sure, understands the, you know, what NED is. They know what it is. They don't need my videos to tell them. They get it. Um, and yet they allow these people for reasons that are above my pay grade. So it is possible that these two Michaels were actually guilty of the things that they're accused of and also that the timing of their arrest was, uh, was spurred on by the arrest of Miss Mung. That's another possibility that, like I said, no one ever mentions. So this is how I think about things. If it is the case that, um, that they didn't do anything wrong and that they were just arrested with no evidence and they're just these innocent bystanders totally randomly selected, um, then I condemn that. That's, in my opinion, that's wrong by the, you know, by the legal guidelines of China's laws. Okay, so for all you idiot haters out there who don't understand English, let me spell it out for you a little bit clearer. If that's what happened, I condemn it. I don't agree with it. Okay? You get it? <laughs> I constantly get accused of, he never says anything but, you know, bad about China. If they did that, then that's completely screwed up, and I don't agree with it. What I'm saying is, we don't have enough evidence to say that they did that. What we have evidence of is that there, is an, there was an exchange-looking thing by the timing. And the other final thing about this that I want to say is, them being released at this time, to me, is not further evidence of the original um, temporal alignment. That is to say, part of the deal releasing, part of the deal being releasing them doesn't mean that they're related other than Canada wanted something from this deal. So, of course, it gets all complicated and muddy, and I don't want to sit here and, you know, act like I'm defending any of these sides. The overall point is that it's not necessarily the case that they're actually related. 
and that will I'm going to talk about that in another way in a little bit here. Um, so I want to uh, I want to yeah thank you Wesker Wesker says that is truly objective, and you know I don't want to say you know it's not just me that can look at things like this. I know a lot of you guys do too. I think that's why you tune into what I have to say because you're you're probably thinking, yeah, exactly. That's what we're saying. The fact is, when it comes to geopolitics and these exchanges between governments and all this stuff that's well above our knowledge, we have to just stick to facts. I mean, that's just how my brain works. We just have to stick with facts. There's so many political commentators out there who run their mouths and just go off of however they feel and just assume and make all these bad um, bad faith assumptions. And I just think it's toxic. It's just a strange way to look at life. I just don't see that that's productive or, in fact, more likely to get you closer to the truth. I think it's just likely to get you popularity because you're... you're appealing to the baseness of people wanting things like revenge and uh, justifications and feeling like they're the right soldiers in the world. But it just doesn't, it's just not how I operate. I don't care if I'm right. I just want to look at things in a very objective way. And the more important an issue is, the more objectively I feel like we should be looking at it. And that's why I take things like the history of China and the 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 politics of uh, of the world today as things which are of the utmost importance that we look at them objectively. And that means that I may have my wants. You know, I want things to be a certain way, but those wants really shouldn't influence the way that I look at things. You know, it really shouldn't. Hot Pot King has a new channel and YouTube recommended it. I'm surprised. Okay, Joel, I'm going to tell you a little secret. One of the reasons that I did this uh, extra channel is that uh, among cr content creators, uh, there is a little known fact to the public, which is that one channel on YouTube is not related to another channel on YouTube in many ways, even if they know that it's the same person. So if you're a controversial person and you get demonetized, for example... That's only one channel normally. And any of your other channels, again, normally, aren't affected at all. So um, if my main channel has some flags on it that you know are putting it down, that won't yet affect this one. So theoretically, this one still has a chance of, uh, of gaining a little bit of traction at least. Uh, now, for those of you desperately trying to send me super chats, of which I know of the 68 people watching, at least 60 plus are trying to do that. This channel doesn't have any monetization or anything like that. So, you know, hotpot.team or just share the videos. That's fine too. Now, another thing I want to do is uh, is I want to I want to do a quick analysis of Meng Wangzhou's interview. I guess you could call it an interview, her her statement, basically. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this. And uh, let me get it set up for you. Now, because I haven't really set this channel up, uh, I'm going to actually have to wait. Oh, thank you, Ryan, for the $4.99 comment. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just... Uh, play some random audio from my desktop. You guys just confirm that you can hear it so we don't have to uh, watch the whole thing and then you guys didn't hear anything. Where she's been holed up under 24-7 security awaiting so let me know the if you can hear that extradition and if the volume's the okay. Mung reached a deferred prosecution agreement with U.S. prosecutors to end the bank fraud case against her after she admitted to misleading a bank about the company's business in Iran. She attended the hearing at the U.S. Can federal courthouse that? in Brooklyn, New York, via a courtroom feed in Vancouver. As part of the deferred prosecution deal, the agreement is in effect until December 2022. Can as hear. long as okay. she doesn't break the Great. Thank you for the confirmation. All right, let me switch over to my left uh, monitor. Hopefully you guys can see all this.
All right, so I'm going to analyze uh, and kind of give you some information about how I see Miss Mung's statement. Firstly, I'd like to th Sorry, let me put on the captions. The captions are actually uh, wrong. They have some mistakes, but it ha still helps a little bit. All right, let me uh, full screen this. Here we go. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Honorable Associate Chief Justice Holmes. So she wants to uh, thank the, that should say honorable, <laughs> not horrible. So she wants to thank the Honorable Chief Justice Holmes and me, obviously, right? I'm sure that that's, you know, that this video got cut. She also uh, mentioned me in here. For her fairness in the whole legal proceedings, I also appreciate the Quan for their professionalism and the Canadian government for upholding the rule of law. So this is an interesting thing. She says uh, she wants to also thank Canada for upholding the rule of law. And this is something that I think people will just uh, brush under the rug. They won't really let that little statement set in. But the fact is, Canada, by doing this, is adhering to the rule of law because it's very clear that the RLC presented by the United States was manifestly unreliable. So she's absolutely correct here. Many thanks to the sheriffs for their hard work. I'm also grateful to Canadian people and the media friends for your tolerance. Sorry for the inconvenience So here she's thanking, you know, Canadian people and, and whoever and kind of apologizing for the inconvenience, kind of saying, you know, sorry about this whole mess, which is uh, very polite. My thanks also go to my shirts who gave me a handing, a help handing when I was being difficult. <laughs> so this part's a little interesting. I, it, is she saying being difficult or in difficult? It's a little bit, I'm not very clear on what she's saying there because her accent's a bit strong and the captions are wrong. So either she's saying, hey, thanks for all, you know, still supporting me when I was like in a bad mood and being a difficult person. Or she's saying, uh, thanks for supporting me when I was in this difficult time, right? So either way, uh, still thanking people around her. Your kindness will be remembered forever. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Chinese Embassy to Canada for their consistent support. I'm very proud of my dedicated lawyers, our in-house lawyers, and all my colleagues who have been striving forward during this hard time. Lastly, to my family, to my friends, to everyone. Is it me? I, I don't I almost don't want to say this, but is it me or does she look a lot better in this video than most of the photos that you see of her from her house arrest days? Is that, am I crazy? But a lot of the photos that I see of her uh, from, from those days, she looks, I want to say older and just like not as good. And this video where she, you actually see her, you know, in, in person, basically, she looks good. Who provided care? and help for me all along the way. Thank you. Okay, so now she's gone through the thanks and everything like that. And, but there's a couple of interesting things here that I think a lot of people will miss. Over the past three years, my life has been turned upside down. It was a disruptive time for me as a mother, a wife, and the company executive. 
So she says over the last three years, her life has been turned upside down and it's been a difficult uh, time for her as a, a wife, a mother, and an executive. So she's, you know, she's humanizing herself. She, this is a very light touch way to say like, yeah, you know, I'm an actual person. I'm not just a bunch of headlines and like, you know, pictures and news articles that you've read. Very soft touch. But I believe every clown has a silver lining. It really was an invaluable experience in my life. So this part, I think a lot of um, smaller news places may may think that this is interesting, I, I believe, is that she, it, it, to most people, it sounds like what she's saying is, actually, you know, this was kind of a good experience. But I think that that, is a bit of a misunderstanding of some parts of the Chinese culture that I've observed, which is, uh, th there's a few things going on here, just a little bit of my over analysis. So first of all, this is a leader person, okay? She's in charge of a lot of, you know, people, and a lot of people look up to her. And she's a woman, she's a businesswoman, and there's a certain attitude that I've found in a lot of like HR and accounting and these types of traditionally, I guess you could say female roles inside of uh, corporations, um, in Chinese women that I've seen, they have this, this very interesting like tenacity where no matter kind of how long the hours are, how much work they have to do and all the sacrifice that they, that they make, they have this infectious optimism about, hey, you know, it still is making me better. It still is, it, I'm learning, I'm, my career is getting better, and, and that kind of thing. And there's a little bit of that that I see here. You know, does she mean it? I, I don't know. I, I never met her. But it sounds like she means it. And it's partially that attitude, but I think it's also partially the fact that she is leading a lot of those types of people. And, you know, I think a, a lot of people, especially women, will look up to her. And this is another way of reinforcing that within uh, that culture. I think that a lot of people in the West, especially, you know, I, I can mostly speak of my own country, we don't have this exactly. We definitely don't have a, as much of a unified feeling of this. And so it's very interesting from my point of view to see her say this because I don't think people will I don't think people will really see this for the you know what it is the way I see it and I also think that it's um it's a very cool part of Chinese culture that really helps uh people in certain categories of jobs to continue to grind and to just go and to make these uh, companies successful and to make their families successful and to go to work every day and do things that's very hard. You kind of have to have some optimism. So this is just a very uh, sort of powerful statement to me. I will never forget all the good wishes I've received from people around the world. I the same goes the greater the difficulty, the greater the growth. The greater the difficulty, the greater the growth. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy to me to hear this because <sighs> this single phrase to me almost perfectly describes the period of Chinese history that I study the most, the hundred years of humiliation. This was a time of very great difficulty to say to say it in the most muted way possible. And now China's experiencing very great amounts of growth. So, I mean, this is just like a perfect expression. Uh, again, does that mean that she wanted to be in Canada drinking maple syrup for three years? Probably not. But this optimism is infectious to me. I really hate being around people who constantly complain and whine about how everything's bad and everyone's negative and everyone's out to get everyone and it's all gone. Get over it, you know? Get over it. 
And uh, I'm sure she's had a lot of emotional roller coasters with this issue, but the message that she's putting out here is to me a very uh, subtle but powerful message, which is that <laughs> it's like, yeah, bad stuff happens, but we move on and we move up and we grow from it. And it sounds so, you know, it's very cliche. It's very um, commonly stated. But in this particular context and with all the research that I do about China, to me, it strikes me as more powerful than some other people that have said it. So maybe I'm just a sucker, but this is pretty cool. Once again, thank you so much. So, you know, this is this is kind of what I would expect. Very sort of, you know, corporate sounding, um, as personal as it can be without, you know, causing some kind of news storm. And uh, uh, short and sweet. But to me, like I said, the main message that I really care about from this is, first of all, her positivity. Second of all, her optimism. Well, it doesn't matter how she, you know, really feels. Maybe she's pissed off at them. Who knows? But the fact is, what she's putting out publicly is, hey, you know, it's over. We're growing, and let's move past it, which I think is amazing. It's little details like this from contemporary Chinese culture that I think people just outside of China just don't get. You know, they they just have their uh, views on how everything is, and they never really like meet people in their environment and see how they actually think and operate. So to me, it's very cool to see her just display that very publicly of like, you know, hey, optimism. Basically, that's the short version of what she said, which is really cool. And honestly, I I was pseudo retired from uh from my career when i decided to take a job in china and little known fact is the reason that i took that job was actually not because i needed a job it was because i either was going to learn chinese or i was going to work with chinese people for the explicit specific purpose of getting to know chinese people not as a tourist but just as somebody who's actually involved in their lives in some way. And that's how I originally started the, um, the job at, at, at a company in Beijing in 2014. And I originally intended to only work there for uh, a year. Sorry, let me switch this back. I originally intended to only work there for a year, but, you know, stuff happened. I got sucked in for, for about four years. But um, that's the type of thing that... I've done in the past that allows me to see things in a slightly different way than some others, especially when it comes to um, the real day-to-day -day operations of how Chinese people actually function. When you come here as a tourist, and sorry to say, it, when you come here as an English teacher, you're missing a lot, a lot of what's actually happening around you because the way that you see Chinese people interacting is in a context that you don't really understand. It's kind of like this. When you first come to China as a foreigner, you don't really hear Chinese, the language. You just sort of hear long streaks of noises that make no sense, and you can't even actually hear each character or each sound. You just hear this like long chain of weird noises that make no sense. And after you're here for a few years, even if you never learn Chinese, something new happens where you no longer hear just a long strain of one fluid sound, but you actually hear distinct sounds. You start to realize this bizarre fact of like, oh, every sound that they're making is literally a character. Wow, that's crazy. And you start to see things in a way that you never could have seen before. And that's kind of similar to what happens when you actually work with Chinese people and live with Chinese people and go to bars and, and you know, events and stuff that aren't for foreigners. They're for Chinese people. Is that you start to understand the context more. And I think that um, 
this type of contextual understanding is one of the critical components of what's missing from the Western understanding of China. If you only read headlines, you will never, ever understand this. You can read all the articles you want, and you just don't know what it feels like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a random you know, HR lady about what her life is like and how she views things. You won't know what it's like to be in a meeting with, um, with many different types of people from China and how they think about things and you just miss all this. So um, so anyway, I'm babbling. But the point is, uh, I did it. I single-handedly got everybody released and uh, ended this crisis, which is great. You're welcome, everybody. <laughs> um, seriously, though, there's a couple of things I want to add to this very short. Um, one is that another possible reason that this happened and this is my optimism, my naivete. The thought has occurred to me several times that if I were the president of the U.S., or if I was somebody that had some control in the left over there, it would really bother me knowing that Biden or the current administration was just basically furthering Trump's agenda not just with this, but with the border situation, with, uh, you know, with Afghanistan in a few uh, ways, with anything, really. I would really start to question myself, like, are we doing this because it's right for America or are we doing it because the guy before us was doing it? And, you know, hopefully this was one of those things where they said, wait, why, why do we start this trade war again? Like, don't we have enough problems of our own? You know, all the racial stuff that's going on and the the constant stuff about guns and abortion and all the things that we as Americans really need to figure out. Do we really need to be out of our borders doing all this dramatic stuff? Now, again, probably very naive, but it's possible that they, that somebody thought, hey, at least this slice of um, outward, I don't want to say aggression, but, you know, slightly aggressive stuff is this actually something we believe, or is this just Trump? And, uh, yeah, you never know. So, anyway, uh, that's pretty much all I had to say about this. I'm happy that everybody's been released. I don't see a causal connection as being confirmed between the two Michaels and Miss um, Mung's case. Although, let's be honest, you, you know, a lot of people are going to feel that way and that's it does make sense to view it that way um now what are the downsides of this what are the implications of this that's something that uh is not going to be good you see something that i've pointed out um especially when it comes to these large issues is that the truth the actual occurrences is far less important than the perceived occurrences. The perceived occurrences are what affects the public opinion and affects potentially future bills and future laws in other countries and attitudes and all this stuff. The world, geopolitically, is not based on facts and actual truths. It's based on the perception of those things, necessarily so, because we are all humans. We're not uh, gods. Sorry, Scientology. Um, so... There will definitely be a lot of right-wing people uh, and even non-right-wing people who attribute the two Michaels situation as basically an aggressive act by China. And like I said, that's not an irrational point of view. It is based on some evidence. Not enough evidence for me, but it is based on some evidence. And the ramifications of that we haven't seen yet. Um my hope is that that doesn't interfere with progress being made between China and Canada and China and America. But we don't know. The fact is, you know, history in the West is written by little nerds on Wikipedia who discount Chinese sources and just, you know, add their own crap in there. Um, as hyperbolic as that sounds, it's actually becoming more and more true, unfortunately. So we don't know what the 
truth will be decided to have been. But the ramifications could be kind of bad. Not horrible, but bad. You're going to always have people out there who just won't accept that these were unrelated. And uh, furthermore, if they were related, you could still just say, well, I mean, they're reacting to an aggression. Okay, sure. I mean, that that's that's another point. Personally, I just don't think that either side should have happened. And if China did do something that goes against its own laws and, and, and morals in the, on the government level, then I condemn that because, like I've always consistently said, the rule of law in all countries means standing by your own laws. And if you don't like those laws, then you can change them. And maybe I'll disagree with what those new laws are, but then you need to stand by those laws. So, um, again, overall, it's a good thing for all countries involved. There are some downsides to it, um, and the perception will not be as good as it could be, especially around the two Michaels. And the whole thing kind of seems like a whole cluster bomb created by Trump, to be honest with you. So, yeah. You're welcome, everybody. <laughs> so anyway, how's everybody doing? I'm kind of in a good mood today, in case you haven't noticed. How long have I been streaming? Uh, I, how do I tell that? I don't know. I don't know how long I've been streaming, but uh, oh, 45 minutes. So I got pretty much nothing else on this. Make sure that you tune in tomorrow because I'm going to blow everybody's mind by doing a live stream about, you guessed it, veganism. Now, here's a little hint. I'm not a vegan, but it's going to be, I think, pretty fun because I'm going to talk about the, the ethical argument for veganism. I'm going to talk about why I think the world should become vegan. And I'm going to very clearly lay out exactly how to become vegan on a worldwide scale and how we're not doing that now and how current vegans aren't achieving that. <laughs> uh, so any questions, any comments, any accusations, any uh, hate speech or other, uh, other comments, let me know. Now's the time. Chat is open. You have... Only moments before I kick you guys out of here and get back to work on Epic China. Please don't make your question be, when is Epic China coming out? I know it's, I said that it might be this week. <sighs> Hopefully it will be next week. I am working tirelessly on it. It is a lot of editing, a lot of research, a lot of tagging photos and videos, and on and on and on. I'm doing it. All right, Ryan, you're banned. How do I ban here? Ban for fake news. <laughs> you know what's funny? Uh, right here. Jenny Lynn. She's, doing, she's certainly doing something right. I love my Huawei phones. You know what the crazy thing is, Jenny? I don't even have a Huawei phone. I have a Samsung from friggin' years ago. You think after all this, I might get sent a, you know, anonymous phone or something. Uh, but that's okay. Might be part of the, the trade war as a deal. China may help the U.S. to resolve the inflation. Yeah, it could be a lot of things. You're right. But in this world, let's all refrain from overly speculating. You know, we've already got so much uh, so much trouble going on because of speculation and because of craziness. Oh, and by the way, uh, you know, as a special, I'm going to toot my own horn and say treat. As a special treat to you guys, um... Do you guys have any suggestions for future live streams and or videos? I have a lot of stuff I'm working on, and I usually don't ask people what they want to hear about, but uh, because you guys have come over to my new channel and subscribed, I will take seriously any suggestions that you make, be it live stream or otherwise. So, any suggestions about future videos? Speak now or forever hold your peace. I need to put the uh, Jeopardy 
theme song on. Chat even happening? Oh, live chat. Am I disconnected? Is this over? Guess uh guess that's it. Nobody has anything. Love the stories about everyday life in China. I have a lot of those, actually. I have a lot of perspective on China. And let me tell you, Ryan, there was a time in my life when I had more uh, energy to do these videos, and I came up with an idea that I think would be really, really cool to do. And it's something maybe I still will do someday. Which is... Uh, and I hate to say travel show, because I know 100,000 people are doing travel shows. It's not really a travel show, but it's kind of like a travel show in that I go to a city or a location in China and I talk about that place. Except the spin is, instead of just like, oh, here's you know the biggest Starbucks and here's a great mall and uh, whatever, I'm going to talk about the historical significance of that place and th crazy things that happened there and events and how, you know, like, for example, in Shanghai, I could talk about the time, like, in the 1800s, when Shanghai was so small that when the Brits came, the whole city just left. All of them. Nobody knows that. Shanghai people don't know that. Chinese historians may know that, but nobody knows this type of stuff. Like, that type of just little detail about how, you know, look around all these people this used to be so small that literally the entire city just got up and left one day, you know, or um, talk about just the way that people, especially the locals, the way that the locals seem to view this area and the way that I see it from a historical perspective and things that I think that they're missing out on and not fully appreciating the significance of and this type of thing. Um, I think it would be pretty cool. And uh, it's not exactly vlogging. It's not travel vlogging because, again, it's not about, oh, here's the biggest hotel. It's more about here's some crazy facts about this place that even everybody around me doesn't even know, you know, that that type of thing. So uh, uh, that's something I, I definitely want to do at some point. I'm sure I'll have a question after the stream ends. <laughs> yeah, that, that type of stuff happens to me all the time. Take care of yourself and be well. Thank you. There's so much history in China. That would be an amazing series. I appreciate that thought. I, I really think it would work. And it wouldn't be that expensive, you know. Uh, flights, hotel, camera crew. I would probably uh, script a lot of it because, you know, I need to get my facts straight. I can't be out there saying, like, oh, it was like, I don't know, 1820? And then later find out it was 1850, you know. Uh, there's a lot to remember. Vegetarian for 25 years, still can't refuse cheese. Um, yeah, pizza's pretty hard to live without for us uh, cheese addicts. But, you know, milk, I've lost all cravings of milk. I, I find milk quite gross. And that's something maybe I'll bring up in the, the next live stream. All right, guys. Well, I guess I will let you guys get back to uh, work, sleep. Uh, partying, whatever you're up to, and I will get back to editing Epic China and uh, chasing after my meowing cat. Cheers, everybody. Bye, and you're welcome.